Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New Books Network. This is Hussein Mohsen, and today I'll be talking with Peter Ungar, author of Evolution's Bite, A Story of Teeth, Diet, and Human Origins. This is a book at the intersection of anthropology, science, history of science, and evolution. Professor Ungar serves as the Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Environmental Dynamics PhD program at the University of Arkansas. He's the author of several books, the most recent of which is Evolution's Bite, which we will discuss today. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Before we delve into the book, uh, our usual first question is if you could tell us about your story as a scholar. And how did you become interested in the book's topic? I guess like many children uh, growing up in in and around the United States, I wanted to be a paleontologist when I grew up. When I was a little boy, I was fortunate enough to uh, go on a class trip in elementary school to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And I, I fell in love with the dinosaurs and the other fossil species. And so that's sort of how I became interested in paleontology. And I guess... I guess I never really grew out of it. Uh, So I pretty much became a a paleontologist. My interest in teeth really stemmed from the fact that they're really the best tools that we have for understanding the past and in particular human evolution. And my interest in diet comes from the fact that um, ecology, the relationship between organisms and their environments uh, is really all about diet. Diet's sort of the most direct uh, indicator we have of the relationship between an animal and its environment. It's the part of the environment that an animal takes in to its own body to sustain itself. So from that perspective, my interest in teeth and evolution goes way back to my childhood. And my interest in in diet uh, really stems from the fact that I really want to understand the past and, and the evolution of animals in it. And the brief introduction you start the book with you tell us that the way we eat and what we eat and its relation to teeth is complicated. There's a relatively common perception that we tend to eat what our teeth have evolved to, uh, you know, uh, chew or consume. But you also tell us that that's not quite the story. On one hand, there is a bit of a discordance between what we eat and what our teeth adapted to eat. And on another, there's another discordance between what we eat today and what we can eat. So if you could tell us briefly about these two discordances, we're going to talk about them in detail and whether they were the driving motivations for you to write this specific book. The short answer is yes. Basically, when I first got to graduate school, there was this fundamental perception that gorillas ate leaves because they had sharp teeth, that chimpanzees ate soft fruits because they had these sort of blunt cusps that were great for pulping and juicing fruits. Orangutans ate hard nuts because they had flat teeth with thick enamel for crushing nuts and bark and things of that nature. We now understand that life is quite a bit more complicated than that. Just because an animal's teeth uh, are adapted to eating certain kinds of foods and they're capable of eating those types of foods. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the the animal prefers to eat on a daily basis, or in fact, what it eats most of the time. So for example, um, you might eat jello, gelatin for, I don't know, um, 360 days a year. If you have to eat rocks five days a year in order to survive, your teeth had better be designed and adapted to eat rocks. So it's really an issue of um, what the limitations are, in effect. Because of this, um, there's been this this common perception uh, out there that that animals eat what they are designed or adapted to eat. And that's really not necessarily the case. Biology is somewhat more complicated than that. So if we go back to chapter one, You tell us about a special kind of a molar tooth that mammals have, and especially homo sapiens, since it's, you know, kind of the center of the book. 
And there is an original link that was made decades earlier between a simple cone shade uh, teeth in reptiles and the specialized teeth of ours. This was made by scholars back then, and it opened the door for this field of study. So if you could tell us about this quote-unquote initiation point of the field. I believe you're talking about, uh, about Edward Drinker Cope and his, re- and his uh, ability to trace the evolution of tooth types from sort of a cone-like structure, like you'd see in many reptiles, uh, to a more sophisticated chewing tooth, like you would see in early mammals, to all the myriad types of mammalian molars we have today. It's called the tribosphenic molar. And basically, it's this interesting compound form that has bunches of of cusps and sharp shearing blades that allow the, the, the possessor of this tooth to do all kinds of things from slicing and shearing to crushing and grinding. And sort of he was able to put together a model that showed how you, you evolve basically from a, a, a cone to this complex Boy Scout knife type general purpose tool to the more specialized forms that we see in many cases today, although some retain that, that original tribosphenic form. There's another piece of the puzzle. Uh, when you talk about Rick Gay and his work starting in the Crompton lab, where he wanted to extend this further. And he started connecting teeth shape to diet. Uh, How did he and his collaborators do so? Basically, the story began with uh, Fuzz Crompton uh, at Harvard and his colleague, Karen Hiamy from the UK, initially. And and what they did was they they actually took animals and they they used X-ray movies to actually watch teeth and how they were used in chewing. And they were able to relate the shapes of teeth to how chewing was done. Rich K joined this effort uh, and started to work with primates and became very interested in the details of how teeth uh, actually functioned and how um, we could take measurements of teeth to relate their shape to their function. And so he sort of came up with a way of basically measuring the lengths of the crests on the teeth, use that to put numbers on what, say, a fruit eater would be and a leaf eater would be and an insect feeder would be. And then the basic idea was to use those numbers to figure out what fossil primates ate by taking the same measurements. And then Rick K became part of the story, right? Yeah, I mean that's basically. I, I think the the one of the interesting take home messages of the book is that the science is really as much a story of the discoverers, the people who actually have done the science, as it is of 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 what they what they found out. I think, for me at least, one of the most interesting parts of the story is the process by which we know what we know and how the different people contributed to it and all the different little pieces and stories and, and coincidences uh, that led to the discoveries that have been made. You worked with Rick at Duke before creating a new lab at the University of Arkansas. And there's a very interesting bit, especially because I'm interested in the diffusion of ideas across disciplines and some of those ideas might sound very different in one discipline but suddenly they make sense in another so if you could tell us briefly how did you use the geographical information systems the gis or how did you suggest that you could use them also to study teeth uh, when you started your lab in the mid-1990s yeah well i was a postdoc at duke working uh, with rich k and others there and a job opened up at the University of Arkansas. It was um, basically what happened was a brand new facility called the Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies uh, was was founded just before I got to the University of Arkansas. And uh, essentially what was done there was uh, the study of geographic information systems, which was pretty new at the time. Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, for your listeners who might not be all that familiar with it, is a, is a way of relating different bits of information to one another that are connected in space. 
classic example. So say you're a farmer and you want to know where to plant your crops. You might take a map of the hydrology, the, the, the way water courses over your land. You might take a, a map of the soil types and you might take a map of the topography, the relief of the surface, superimpose all of these maps, all of these layers, one on top of another, and look for the right combination of traits to tell you where to plant your crops. Well, one thing that uh, GIS is very good at is mapping landscapes, right? And so when the job opened at the University of Arkansas and I applied for it, and this was a job essentially to hire an anthropologist who could use this new facility, I started to think, how could I use this? And at that point, I didn't know even what GIS was. I had to look it up. But I, I began to envision the use of GIS to map landscapes. And I started to think about teeth. Well, teeth are basically landscapes. You could model cusps as mountains. You could model fissures as valleys and use all the tools available to you in GIS in order to take more sophisticated measurements. And that's sort of where that, that came about. I'm always fascinated by that, particularly when it comes to, you know, the notion of paradigm shifts and how many quote unquote outsiders sometimes come with their ideas and either transform fields or introduce very different lenses. Um, now, in chapter two, the story becomes more complicated and it starts getting so. Uh, we already touched on that in the introduction when we said it's not as simple as just eating what our teeth evolved to chew. Uh, and you tell us about something that's called species-specific adaptations when it comes to teeth. So what are those factors that shape those adaptations. And I'm wondering if you could give us an example of two species that might have similar teeth, but eventually might have very different diets. Well, in the 1970s and 80s, Bob Sussman, uh, most recently of um, Washington University um, in St. Louis, came up with the idea of species-specific dietary adaptations. He went into the wild and he studied lemurs from different parts of Madagascar and found that ones that lived in different forest patches, even if there were very different foods species available in these different patches, would seek out foods with similar properties. And he reasoned, and it was a reasonable thing to do at the time, that the selection of specific kinds of foods was because that's what your body was adapted to eat, right? That's what your teeth and your guts told you to eat. So if you're adapted to eat leaves, even if the same tree type is not available in two different forests, if you live in one of those two forests, you're going to look for the same kinds of foods. And that, that was the basic gist. And paleontologists loved it at that point because we don't really have access to the specific species of foods in many cases that uh, an animal ate in the past. But you know what, if we can make certain assumptions, we could look at the shapes of teeth and say, okay, well, this animal probably ate food X on the basis of its tooth shape. Now, when you start to actually go into the forest and watch primates eat, you learn very quickly that things are somewhat more complicated than that. I'll give you two examples. First example would be um, great cheeked Manga bees and sooty manga bees. These are old world monkeys that specialize, or at least have anatomy suggesting that they specialize on hard nuts. The gray cheeked manga bee, actually, let's start with the sooty manga bee. The sooty manga bee lives in the Thai forest of the Ivory Coast. There are about a dozen species of primate that live in that same forest. Both manga bees have very similar teeth and jaws flat teeth, very thick enamel, very powerful jaws as I said, seemingly adapted to eating hard foods like nuts and bark. Well, certainly the ones in the Thai forest do that a lot. They specialize on a type of nut called a sacaglottis nut. Sacaglottis nuts resemble peach pits. They are rot resistant. They fall to the forest floor. Nobody else in the forest has the kind of teeth and jaws necessary to break into them because they're so hard. But these monkeys can, and they do, because their teeth allow them to. That's what they specialize on. These foods are available year-round, and that's what they eat. 
that gives these monkeys an advantage over anybody else because they don't have to compete with the other primates. Let's compare that with the great-cheeked manga bees of Uganda. Again, similar teeth and jaws. But in the case of great-cheeked manga bees, they prefer and most of the time eat soft, fleshy fruits. There's nothing about their teeth or jaws that says they can't eat those foods. And they do, and they prefer them. They only switch to hard foods during those very rare times when the soft fruits they prefer aren't available. Why? Well, even though they like the soft fruits better, when the other foods are, when, when these foods aren't available, they have the anatomy they need to eat the hard foods. And so what we're looking at is two very closely related species with very similar teeth, but different diets. The adaptation is to the same kind of food, but different diets. One more example, mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas live uh, in Central Africa and uh, the, the Western part of East Africa at, at different elevations. Those that live at lower elevations have access to soft fruits, and that's what they eat most of the year. Those that live at higher elevations don't have access to soft fruits. And most of the year they eat wild celery and stems and leaves and other tough, lower quality foods. Turns out that mountain gorillas prefer soft fruits and they eat them when and where they can get them. So once again, what we're looking at is we're looking at an issue of availability. Where soft fruits are available, they will eat them. During times of year when those aren't available, they will fall back on, they will switch to the lower quality foods because their teeth are sharp, they're, they're bladed, they're capable of slicing and shearing through tough foods. Their guts allow them to process those kinds of low quality foods as well. Where those foods aren't available, where, sorry, soft fruits aren't available at all during the year, mountain gorillas at higher elevations will eat those very tough foods year round. They'll eat leaves and stems and wild celery year round, not because they want to, but because they have to and they can. In this case, it's the same species with the same shaped teeth, but very different diets driven by availability. Again, we go back to this, again, we go back to this concept of the biospheric buffet, right? Animals will eat whatever foods nature lays out for them. And they'll they'll have certain preferences that they'll take when they can. Well, you use the words, you know, preferences, prefer, like, and want. Uh, in a recent interview, I talked to Rob Dunn about his recent book with Monica Sanchez. The book's title was Delicious, which was about the role that flavor might have played in the process of evolution. There is certainly is the factor of availability and competition. But do you think just the mere flavor and pleasure that it might be associated with some foods be playing uh, a role in that too? Absolutely. And in fact, different animals have different preferences. Um, as another example, how do we know that gorillas prefer soft, fleshy fruits to leaves? Well, the easiest thing to do is to give the, the gorilla an option, right? And Melissa Remus from Purdue University did just that for her dissertation research. She went to the San Francisco Zoo and she took gorillas, this time lowland gorillas, but nevertheless gorillas, and went up to their cages and actually put at different corners of the cages different kinds of foods. Mangoes on the one hand, uh, kale and celery and broccoli on the other hand. Every single time, these gorillas went for the, first for the soft, fleshy fruits like the mangoes. And that's because they're sugary, they're yummy, they're easy to digest, they're high in energy. They're the kinds of things that animals eat when they're available. It's what they prefer to eat. Well, the book, and this is something I noticed and was a bit surprising, that the book is as much about human origin as it is about teeth. There are chapters that are almost entirely talking about human history and origins before you take us back to the lab and what the results um, by, you know, the, of studying teeth would suggest. So in the third chapter, which you titled Out of the Garden, hmm. 
you tell us about our origins and some of the hypotheses. Uh, so if you can very briefly tell us from what we know at the moment, uh, what are the major factors that have led to the expansion of the savanna and when did that take place? Well, um, the factors that led to the expansion of savannas in, in Africa uh, relate to, well, th there's a couple of factors that are involved, right? It's a combination of the fact that what I call our restless planet and what I call the, the dance between Earth and Sun. It turns out that the, there's this cyclical pattern, this pattern of what we call Milankovitch cycles that depend on the tilt of the Earth's axis and the distance between Earth and Sun. Uh, which is dictated by the shape of the orbit of the Earth. And, and these things sort of change around uh, in, a, in, a, in a cyclical manner. And so, so the amount of solar radiation hitting the planet varies over time. At the same time, the Earth's crust is sitting on these plates. The, the, the land masses and the oceans are sitting atop these plates that are constantly moving around creating mountain ranges and deep rifts. When you combine the actions of this, uh, the, the changing orbital dynamics, the changing relationship or, or complex dance between Earth and Sun, with this restless Earth, with the movements of the continents, you get changes in, in large scale, regional, even global vegetation, right? And one such set of changes really occurred between about six million years ago, and it's it's still continuing today, as the Rift Valley in East Africa, for example, uh, spreads, we've seen a general trend towards cooling and drying conditions, and the the great forests that that span the African continent, millions and millions of years ago during the Miocene, have on the eastern side begun to dry out, and on the western side as a rain shadow becomes cast on East Africa, you start to see rains falling from the west or from the, from the east towards the west. And what that does is it creates savanna on the east and it creates rainforest on the west. And this happens to be about the time that our common ancestors with chimpanzees actually began to split into more human-like and more chimpanzee-like forms that can be traced back to these initial changes in environmental conditions. Well, you described to us changes in this chapter that took place on multiple scales. Like we're talking, even when we, we talk about time, it's decades, millennia, and sometimes millions of years. And there's also, like you mentioned, the changes in Earth's orbit or the global temperature or uh, tectonic activity. Beside the Great Rift Valley, which uh, occupies a good share of the chapter, an interesting point was your description of lakes and how lakes might, on one hand, be a bridge between all of these changes and, consequently, on the other, uh, it has really... You know, lakes in part shaped our history in how communities were temporarily made and then separated. So if you could tell us more about lakes and the role uh, they might have played. Sure. Well, there's a body of theory that suggests pretty clearly that when you take a big homogenous population that's connected across space and you split it up, you make sort of these small isolated groups. That's sort of the fuel for evolution, right? And as environmental conditions change, and one thing that I didn't really mention was the fact that it's not just as this sort of continuous cooling and drying that occurs in Africa over the course of human evolution, but there's fluctuations back and forth from cooler and drier conditions to warmer and wetter conditions. And these fluctuations seem to increase over time, leading to, to much more dramatic changes and less predictable conditions. Part of this phenomenon involves lakes constantly forming and constantly 
disappearing. They get larger, they get smaller. And what that does is it cuts off migration routes for, uh, for hominins as they move up and down the Rift Valley, for example. Um, what it does is it completely, uh, it, it creates patchy distributions of species as they become separated uh, when lakes form or when they're when they rejoin when the lakes shrink and so I, I think anything that's going to dramatically impact the way a species is distributed leading to isolation and separation and then sort of bringing them back together it, it is going to drive evolution speaking of evolution and human origins um, you tell us about you know debates about human origins and where the whether the homo genus or homo sapiens evolved and the up till the early 1900s there was a debate about that origin and in 1924 in particular there was a discovery that was about to start shifting this conversation uh, there's a student who brought to Raymond Dart a skull that would later appear to carry very important scientific information. Uh, what's the skull and how did it shift this debate? You're talking about the Tong child. Exactly. Which was a uh, the skull of a young kid, maybe three or four years of age. Uh, it all depends on whether you use a more chimpanzee-like or a more human-like model for growth and development. Uh, and basically, until this point, Many people believe that humans did not evolve in Africa, that they evolved in Europe or Asia. But when Raymond Dart was presented with the Tong child in 1924, or actually he wasn't presented with the Tong child, but when Raymond Dart discovered the Tong child in 1924, and the, the student actually brought fossils that were not this skull, the student brought other fossils, which led Raymond Dart to uh, ask the, the, the mine keeper to send even more fossils to him. And it was from that second group of fossils that the Tong child was discovered. Dart made the connection that what he was looking at could be a human ancestor because its teeth looked fairly human-like and the uh, spinal cord would have come out underneath the skull rather than in back of the skull which suggests that this hominin would have walked on two legs instead of four. So when you look at these sorts of things, uh, it leads one to suspect that maybe humans didn't evolve after all in Europe and Asia, but that they evolved in Africa. Another important piece of the puzzle was that there was a general perception that a large brain was absolutely key to human evolution. You had to become smart before anything else happened. And what the Tong child showed was more human-like teeth and possibly upright posture before the brain expanded. Because the Tong child had, had a small brain, not all that much larger than a chimpanzee's today. So it was this combination of brain size coming later and humans first evolving in Africa that really led people to start looking on the continent and changing their, their viewpoint about how human evolution progressed. Well, before getting back to teeth and how they were used to distinguish between different hominins, um, there's actually an interesting point about brains. Uh, there is this common understanding about brain size and evolution, but you also, in one of the chapters, give us a counterexample where this is still not a settled question. There were other species where the brain wasn't as large, but still they were able to develop tools. So if you could tell us more about this, uh, you know, in particular. Well, there's always been this debate, right, about what's more important, the size of your brain or the complexity of your brain, you know, how dense your neural net is, how many convolutions you have, uh, where the different parts of the brain, um, where, where the emphasis is put and so forth. One of the big problems is that we don't have a lot of detail about the brains of human ancestors. All we've got are skulls. And we've got sometimes casts of the external part of the brain. Uh, so, so the amount of information we actually have is, is fairly limited. One thing that has come to light in recent years is that you don't necessarily have to have a very large brain to have some human-like attributes. Like, for example, um, the, the hominins from Flores, 
Homo floresiensis, which are, you know, 100,000 years old, maybe a bit, a bit more recent than that even, had small Australopithecus or even chimpanzee almost like and sized brains. But they made stone tools. They've controlled fire. They hunted. Uh, and so this one-to-one uh, -one -one tie between brain size on the one hand and intelligence on the other, like everything else in biology, it's complex. Uh, speaking of teeth, the main topic of the book, how did uh, paleontologist John Robinson and his, teeth, uh, his team use teeth to differentiate between hominin species? Well, basically, when you put teeth together with skulls especially, you find that they oftentimes will differ in size and shape in ways that seem to relate to diet. And I think one of John Robinson's greatest contributions was the fact that he was able to help identify three different types of hominin species. At the time, he thought that they all lived in Africa at the same times in the same places. Turns out that wasn't quite true. But nevertheless, he showed some differences between Australopithecus, which were the earlier forms, we now know are earlier forms, with moderate sized teeth and moderate size inci uh, cheek teeth, that is molars and incisors. Uh, and he, he considered those pretty much dietary generalists. And their uh, descendants group, the Paranthropus group, which were a highly specialized group that, that are not really our ancestors. They're sort of near cousins with much larger, flatter teeth with thicker enamel. And a group that at the time was called Telanthropus, now is called Homo erectus, that had smaller cheek teeth, but still large incisors. And um, they were a bit, a, a bit sharper with a bit thinner enamel. And he was the first to really look for the differences between these uh, these tooth forms in these three different types of human ancestors and argue that those related to differences in dietary adaptations. In the fifth chapter, we go back to the lab and you try to connect those changes at the level of the environment that we talked about to teeth by studying the teeth through uh, food prints. What are these prints and how are they detected? Well, basically, there's two categories of evidence we have for diet. The first category of evidence we have is the anatomy, right? It's the sizes, the shapes, and the structures of teeth. What those tell you is what an animal was adapted to eat, what an animal was capable of eating. But we, as we've already discussed, that's not the same as what an animal ate on a daily basis or what an animal preferred to eat in the context of what was available to it. In order to get at what animals actually eat, you need more direct lines of evidence. I use the term food prints, which to me uh, sounds like footprints. Footprints are traces of actual activity of the person who walked across the beach, for example, in the past. They are actual traces of that walking. In the same way, food prints are actual traces of feeding, of eating. The food print that I prefer to study involves tooth wear. And since the teeth uh, of an individual wear in a specific characteristic way based on what's being eaten, that can help us understand what that particular individual ate in the past. There are several different types of food prints. You can look at the microscopic pattern of wear on the teeth. You can look at the chemistry of the teeth because the chemistry of the teeth relates to the chemistry of the foods that gave the animal the raw materials necessary to make those teeth. So it's, a, it's, it's sort of a newish category of evidence that we can use to really tell the difference between whether an animal is doing on a daily basis what its teeth have evolved to eat or whether it's eating something else. In the same chapter, you know, you add more nuance to the debate and you present a number of interesting counterintuitive observations. Um, one in particular that caught my attention had to do with specialized teeth. So intuitively, one might think that specialized teeth in a certain species would imply specialized diet. But it seems that wasn't always the case. Uh, can you give us an example of this? 
Absolutely. That's a really good point. We go back to the example of rocks and jello. <laughs> Anybody can eat jello. It doesn't take any kind of a tooth. You could just slurp it. But if you want to be able to expand your diet to include other foods, you've got to be able to make teeth that are capable of processing mechanically challenging foods. You will look like a specialist, but you will be a generalist in the sense that you can eat foods that aren't very challenging for teeth and foods that are at the same time challenging for teeth. Let's go back to our example of the great cheeked manga bees from Kabali in Uganda. They've got pretty specialized teeth, that, but they eat soft fruits and hard nuts, whereas the other primates that live alongside them that have less specialized teeth just eat soft fruits. Having these specialized teeth allow you to eat a broader spectrum of foods. This is something called Leem's paradox. So you differentiate between two hominin, hominin ge, uh, genuses, if that's the plural of genus. Genera. Uh, <laughs> genera, cool. <laughs> so uh, there is the paranthropus, who are generalized eaters. Like you were describing, they had a wide variety of teeth. Uh, they tended to have bigger, flatter, and thicker teeth and very powerful jaws. But then you move to our genus, the homo genus. Uh, which seems to find, like, to have found different "quote unquote" solutions to adapt and grow. What are the basically hallmarks of these adaptations and solutions that the Homo genus developed? Well, the Homo genus actually seems to reverse the trend that began with Australopithecus. Right when you start off with a with a, an even earlier ancestor an Ardipithecus-like ancestor. The teeth are modest in size, the enamel is modestly thin, and the, um, th they're a little bit crestier teeth than in the more specialized forms like Australopithecus, and especially Paranthropus, which have bigger, as you said, bigger, flatter teeth with thicker enamel. When we get to Homo, we start to see these trends reversing. We start to get thinner enamel, we start to get smaller molar teeth. We start to get a little bit crestier teeth. Now this uh, suggests to me that rather than, than, than having these specialized adaptations, the adaptations are becoming perhaps more generalized. And the classic explanation for this has to do with the fact that humans are beginning to process their foods in ways other than just using teeth. You start to get stone tools appearing in the archaeological record. Eventually, you get fire that helps uh, with food processing. And so as technology begins to take over the role of teeth in preparing foods for digestion, that's when you start to see perhaps some relaxation of the pressures of natural selection on the, the jaws and teeth. And so we are both and our listeners are on the same page. Um, in chapter six, you also tell us about this historical confusion about categorization, be it for a genera, be it for species. And you tell an interesting story that happened in the 1950s in one of the Cold Spring Harbor meetings, uh, the Cold Spring Harbor lab meetings. Uh, how are you defining genus in the book or which definition you're using? Sure. Well, the, the classic and standard definition of genus is a group of closely related organisms that share a sort of fundamental way of doing things in the world, that share, essentially share sort of a, an adaptive zone, right? So as originally conceived by Linnaeus back in the 18th century, each species has two names, a general name for the kind of species, which plays into the whole idea of adaptive zone, and a specific name. The general name is the genus, 
The specific name is the species. Speaking of those patterns, especially when it comes to genus as an umbrella term, you already touched on the effect developing tools might have had on the size of the teeth in the homogeneous, broadly speaking. But again, as we get more into the details, you tell us that there are many examples where this pattern wasn't so clear. There are few pages that are entirely dedicated for the homogeneous and how there are examples where species within a homo have different patterns when it comes to the size of the teeth or maybe the function. So if you could tell us a couple of those examples uh, that defy the pattern. Sure. Well, I think the best example is, is, uh, has to do with the work of Bernard Wood and Mark Collard. Several years ago, they pointed out that the earliest members of our biological genus, say Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, actually had teeth that weren't all that different in size from their Australopithecus predecessors. And so they made the argument that they really hadn't made the jump from an Australopithecus type adaptive zone to a Homo type adaptive zone. And they proposed that these early members of our genus be shifted from Australopithecus, or sorry, from Homo back to Australopithecus in terms of their name. Uh, today, most paleoanthropologists retain Homo largely sort of as an historical phenomenon. Uh, based in part on the fact that there are some changes that we do see occurring, like uh, at least in forms like Homo rudolfensis, a larger brain size, uh, shrinking snout, um, and and presumably um, stone tools that show up in the in the archaeological record associated with with these species. Now, I, I have to admit that there's also Paranthropus at that time, so we can't be certain that Paranthropus wasn't making the tools. And I also have to admit that the earliest members of the genus Homo still had relatively short legs compared with their arms, and they hadn't come down completely uh, out of the trees. So there is, sir, there has been, I should say, some debate as to sort of what this shift in adaptive zone from a more Australopithecus-like creature to a more human-like creature, and I use the term human loosely as genus homo there's been some debate as to sort of how that shift proceeded whether it was gradual whether it was uh, uh abrupt and so forth but speaking of debates there's a relatively you know um, or another debate that's relatively popular uh, when we talk about humans generally speaking we talk about evolutionary patterns related to tool development teeth obligate bipedality and enlarged brains. Uh, can you order those for us within the genus based on the uh, evidence we have uh, at the moment? Sure. Um, in the 1990s, a researcher named Misia Landau at Boston University did a wonderful PhD dissertation and wrote a couple of wonderful papers about how bias and preconception enter into our perceptions and our narratives about human evolution. The example she gave was early evolutionary biologists, including people like Charles Darwin, uh, Frederick Wood Jones, Grafton Elliott Smith, and so forth, um, and, and how they strung together the different narrative elements, which came first. And as I've already mentioned, the initial viewpoint was that a large brain came before coming down to the ground. Because if you didn't have a large brain and you came down to the ground, you would probably be eaten pretty quickly. Because the reality is, when you are a small, helpless hominin without big canine teeth, without projectile weaponry, without fire, you're dead meat if you're not smart enough to be able to avoid the, um, the predators. But thanks in large part to work uh, by people like Raymond Dart as early as 1925, later by people like Don Johansson and his colleagues from the Institute of Human Origins and the discovery of Lucy. What we found out was that coming down to the ground actually came before the enlargement of the brain. So it turns out that the first thing that seems to have happened is we start to come down out of the trees. At the same time, 
we start to see some changes in tooth form suggesting changes in diet. And then subsequently, we, uh, we, we see adaptations for uh, full terrestriality, that is completely abandoning the trees, and an increase in brain size that seem to uh, have continued through the course of human evolution. Now, it's been in fits and spurts. Some species retain small brains. Some species grew larger brains. Some species maintain brain sizes for over a million years. But there is sort of this general trend that, that does seem to have occurred. And that did come after coming down to the ground. But along with both, we see sort of continuous changes in tooth shape. And where do tools, uh, you know, where, where are they placed in the story? Were they in parallel with enlarged brain size or before? Because there's some confusion there too, I think. Yeah. Well, the earliest stone tools we have, there's some debate as to, as to, as to the dates of the earliest stone tools. Some have argued that stone tools appear, uh, and recent evidence suggests it's likely, more than 3 million years ago. Others say it's 2.8 or 2.5 million years ago with the origins of our biological genus, Homo. Regardless of, of where that is, it's pretty clear that stone tools sort of entered the picture before massive brain enlargement. We do see with larger brains, more sophisticated tools. And um, like, so for example, there's a, a type of hand axe called the Acheulean hand axe that's tear shaped. And it's very clear that the, that the maker of that tool had a, had a clear idea, clear perception of what that tool should look like when the tool's completed. Uh, it is, you know, when you pick up a hammer, you know it's a hammer. When you pick up an Acheulean hand axe, you know it's a hand axe. The earliest stone tools were basically cobbles that had been struck one against the other to form sort of these, these hard, these, these, these sharp flakes that could be used for cutting and slicing. So there was no sort of preconceived idea of what these earliest stone tools should look like. We do see as the brains start to enlarge in species with larger brains, uh, more sophisticated tool types. One way I would describe the book is that it's a book of questions more than a book of answers. Which So as comprehensive and rigorous it is, especially when it comes to teeth and their evolution, I think a main trend in the book was to avoid reductionist, simplistic answers, particularly with the growing evidence we keep accumulating. And this is something I'm, I'm very interested in in general, and that's one of the several reasons I like the book. When we talk about, uh, in this chapter, we talked about, you talked about tools, fire, cooking, and sharing animal praise um, as factors that, quote unquote, made us human. We started developing communities and whatnot. But that was only part of the story, because in the last section of the book, you tell us about the Neolithic revolution. And there seems to be competing hypotheses about this period and why agriculture and animal domestication spread. Um, on one hand, it's related primarily to climate shifts. On another, there might be some psychocultural patterns where homo sapiens started to think of themselves differently and about their position in, the, uh, in nature. Um, what are these theories and which one do you align more with? Look, we don't have a time machine, and that's what it would really take to, at this point at least, uh, explain exactly why the origins of civilization occurred. And I use the words origins rather than origin because it happened independently in several different places at slightly different times. And it's possible that in different places, there are different reasons for it, right? And as I said, it would take a time machine really to work it all out. Many of the theories are pretty much just so stories. They're not testable hypotheses. Many of the theories involve association rather than causative correlation, right? We see, for example, changes uh, in the environment associated with the Younger Dryas event, uh, the end of the last major glacial advances uh, at the end of the, 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 the Pleistocene epoch. Well, 
it turns out that there is roughly an association between some of these climatic events in some places and people sh starting to plant crops, right? Starting to uh, husband animals and so forth. Whether these associations are causative is not entirely clear. I sort of favor an environmental explanation because at least we can see a clear association that makes intuitive sense in terms of cause and effect, but testing it is much more difficult. Yeah, you were very clear in the stand you took on this debate. You said that the psychocultural you know, hypotheses might have some merit, but also you're on the side of what's quote-unquote test is more testable. Um, and when it comes to the Neolithic revolution, there is usually this common perception that, you know, communities grow, nutrition became better, etc. But you also tell us that this is not exactly the story, again. And you give examples, for example, uh, Thea Mollison uh, from the British Museum, who examined skeletons in the Abu Huraira region in Syria. Uh, and she had a bit of a different story. What did uh, Mollison's findings suggest? Well, Mollison's findings, as well as that of many other bioarchaeologists who work on the origins of agriculture and the dawn of civilization, Mollison found that life wasn't necessarily all that good with the origins of agriculture. People tended to be healthier when they were hunters and gatherers. And part of the reason for this is it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's awful hard work planting crops. Now, or, or raising animals. And the other issue associated with this is that it's a lot easier to plant one kind of crop or raise one kind of animal than to, than to plant all kinds of different crops and raise all kinds of different animals. And when you sort of limit your resources to one or two food staples, you may have enough calories, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the right mix of nutrients for a healthy lifestyle. And so the basic idea is that when we, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, they were able to have a healthy lifestyle because they had a broad-spectrum diet that, that gave them all the nutrients they needed to survive and thrive. But when agriculture comes around, life gets hard. It's not easy to plant crops and raise animals. And the variety of different kinds of foods that you have access to can decline as well if you're not careful about it. So I think that, uh, that these two things in combination, the hard work that was involved and the limiting diet really had a negative impact on people. All right. We've already held you up for a significant amount of time. Um, so if you'd like to tell us about what you're working on at the moment and what are your future projects? Sure. Well, I've pretty much done <laughs> tooth shape and microware, uh, dental topography and microware of the early hominins. And so we spent, my colleagues and students and I have spent so much time developing these techniques that I'm really starting to apply them in completely unrelated areas. Areas that sort of give relevance and meaning to the, to the developmental work that, that I've been involved with for the past 25 years. And I'm really working in two different areas now. One area is clinical dentistry. The same techniques that we use to assess dental microware can be used to look for susceptibility to erosion or caries, cavities, and so forth. And working with uh, clinic clinicians, dentists, and clinical researchers uh, in medical schools uh, on NIH-funded projects to better understand what causes uh, teeth to, to, to rot and, and wear how we can avoid that uh, and, and sort of what um, signatures on the microscopic wear level, at least, clinicians can use to gauge whether or not we're susceptible to wearing our teeth away or to, to putting holes in them. The other area of research that I'm working on is the impacts of climate change on animals today. Just got an NSF grant to work in the high Arctic uh, in in uh, the Amal region of, of Russia. And we can use the same tools that were developed for looking at fossils to measure things like 
food choice and nutritional stress in living animals like reindeer, like Arctic foxes, like lemmings, and see how global warming and extreme weather events are influencing and, and, and changing the diets and physiologic stress of these animals. So we can sort of better predict what's going to happen to them in the future. And in the case of animals like reindeer that, that herders have to deal with, how those herders can um, shift the reindeer around to, to, to make them more resilient to the coming changes. So right now, the, the focus of my research has really moved on from human evolution proper to using the tools we developed to study human evolution uh, to, to, to things that are, are, are relevant and important to us today, to the, the wicked problems we face. Well, this sounds like an exciting set of projects, uh, particularly because I'm assuming they're going to involve field research in the Arctic, right? Uh, yep, I'm going in about two weeks again. Well, <laughs> safe travels, enjoy your trips, because this sounds quite exciting. Uh, and this was an enjoyable conversation. So, Peter, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. It was great to be with you. Thanks to you and to our listeners. Until next episode.